Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, we have a really fun and interesting lecture, uh, a great chef. Um, I'll introduce uh, Tracy in a minute. Um, but uh, so today we'll hear uh, Tracy and the uh, science of hand-pulled noodles and something about noodles. Um, Thursday, the class will be about texture and elasticity. Um, and the lab will be the elastic modulus of uh, pancakes. Um, this week really is about another important aspect of cooking. You know, we think about and we've discussed changes in taste, in flavor, changes in appearance, how they look, all the cool ways you can prepare food, the phase transitions they go. But part of the pleasure of eating is what does the food feel like when you put it in your mouth, the mouthfeel of the food. And that's what we're going to discuss um, this week and again uh, the following week, not next week but after that, is mouthfeel. And that's really an important part of eating, important part of the pleasure of eating, how it, how it, uh, how it feels. And we try to quantify it. We're going to quantify it in various ways. But let me say at the outset that there's still the science of quantifying mouthfeel is still an ongoing effort. We're going to talk about um, elasticity. That's the stiffness, how hard something is. And um, I'll say that, you know, in my research lab, we have a whole bunch of machines. They're called rheometers that measure elasticity. And if you're thinking of final projects you want to do something with, you can come and use those machines. But you go to some food lab, some lab and a big company, they'll have lots of, they'll have a whole battery of these machines. And we understand how to make the basic measurements, but how to really relate mouthfeel to the properties, measurable properties of food is still an ongoing topic of research. So what we'll discuss is elasticity and viscosity. Elasticity refers to a solid. So you can see these rock candies, talked about them with Joanne, right? They're clearly really very, very elastic. They're very tough. They're very stiff. Um, we'll actually eat some steak, or Daniel will cook some steak uh, next class. This is not as tough. It's much more squeezable. But how much it's cooked? The toughness of the steak will depend, the stiffness of the steak will depend on how it's cooked. So a simple way of relating its cooking to its, uh, a degree of cooking to its physical properties is through the elastic properties, through how solid it is, how tough it is, how stiff it is. Um, Jello. Anybody know what Jello is made up of? Gelatin. How much gelatin is it? Pardon? How much gelatin is there in that jello? Any idea? Pardon? How many spoons are there in that thing of jello? Pardon? Oh, come on, estimate. 20. I, I would say 50, but whatever. It's a lot, right? And one spoon of jello, and the rest is all water, right? That's the point. That's the point. Whether it's 20 or 100, I don't care. It's not a whole lot of gelatin and a lot of water. So that's mainly water. Does it flow like water? No, it doesn't. It's a solid, right? That's the cool thing about a gel. We'll talk about that later on, uh, uh, on Thursday. right? It's very cool, but you're absolutely right. It's gelatin, but it's not a whole lot of gelatin. But it's still a solid. So there's all kinds of different solids. This is a much less stiff solid 
than the meat is, and much less than raw candy. And you notice that, and it tastes different, right? You get a different taste and different pleasure when you eat them. You don't get the same feeling, the same mouthfeel with these different foods. And of course, there's also liquid, milkshake, gravy, all these things. They flow, they're not solids, so we don't characterize them by their elasticity, we characterize them by the viscosity. And we'll discuss that later in the class. But they're also very important for um, the mouthfeel. So a milkshake, a really creamy, thick milkshake, is a different sensation than just a glass of milk, right? And that's the viscosity. And we'll do this uh, on, Tuesday, on Thursday. Just look at these pieces of steak from raw meat to overcooked meat. They clearly behave differently, right? They clearly taste differently. You get a different uh, feel in your mouth, a different pleasure, depending how you like them. Some people like them bleu, almost raw. Other people like them medium. Other people like them well done. The stiffness, the elasticity of the steak also changes. And we're going to quantify that on Thursday. And Daniel will cook us some steak so we can see it, we can measure it. Different kinds of materials, kind of pancake, we'll measure the elasticity of pancake, uh, bread, noodles, we'll hear more about that. Those are all solids. This is probably clam chowder, right, where we are? Clam chowder, that flows. Mashed potatoes, well, that's sort of on the border between solid and liquid. That's how much milk you make them with, right? And um, we'll talk about this. Um, normally, if you're making a white sauce, you can do that by adding flour. And you usually you think of it, you stiffen, you, st uh, you, sorry, you thicken the sauce, you thicken the gravy by adding flour. That makes it more viscous. But it can do a lot of other things. In fact, you know you can even make it into a solid, right? And that's what Tracy's going to do, and that's what um, uh, bread does. So it's made up of starch. Starch is a, a polymer. We won't go into all the details, but we'll understand something about this. Um, and we need to understand a little bit about it. Starch is granules of starch. And I don't want to go into the really complicated chemistry and physics of what happens, but the granules, when you put them in hot water, they swell, polymers come out, and if you have them crowding to some extent, you get, visco you get extra viscosity. We'll talk about that later. But if you have enough of these cross-linking polymers, they can form a solid. And you can get a solid-like uh, material. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the granules of, um, of wheat starch and the connections between them, so they can become a solid. So I don't want to talk more. I want to introduce Tracy. I want to say a few things about Tracy, first of all. Uh, We've been really privileged in this class. She's been sort of part of it almost from the beginning. Um, and she combines really a wonderful uh, cooking ability as, as a chef with an innate curiosity of the science behind it. And um, she's taken part of, in our class um, for many years. And I remind you that Coming soon, not too long, we'll have the final projects. And Tracy, I think, is going to tell us some things about um, the final uh, 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 about challenges. And 
She can give you examples where people have done final projects inspired by her questions that she wants to understand. And those, rec or those ideas have ended up in her recipe, in her uh, uh, restaurant, one of the dishes in the restaurant. Her restaurant's Pagu, it's in Central Square. It's a fabulous restaurant. Um, and she'll uh, suggest ideas now. Uh, and so I encourage you to listen. And uh, if you want to have really cool ideas for your final project with somebody who's local, who can help, um, uh, you can think about that. And I know Tracy is always open to uh, working with students. So uh, Tracy Chang, uh, she's been with us for a long time. She uh, has this fabulous restaurant in Central Square, and she gives a great talk, and I'll leave it to her. Tracy, right. all yours. Thank you, Dave. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this may or may not be the current state of my restaurant at this moment. I'm usually there, but when I'm not, maybe there are some fires going on. Um, I'm not typically uh, lecturing at Harvard. Um, I'm like Julia and Alex, usually behind the scenes, helping the other chefs out. Um, I've been a TF with the program. Um, and uh, like Dave said, have been a part of this kind of since... Um, almost day one. So it's been almost uh, 10 years, 11 years now. Um, I opened a restaurant four years ago, and that's usually where you can find me. Um, and when I'm not there, my friends send me photos of what is going on really behind the scenes at the restaurant. So <laughs> as much as I feel better um, about uh, putting out fires there, I'm here today so that we can chat about uh, hand pulled noodles. But before we talk about noodles, I think it would be um, you know, it would be helpful if I uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, grew up kind of in the restaurant industry. My grandmother had a restaurant in Cambridge uh, close to Fresh Pond. Um, she was a midwife her entire life in Taiwan. Um, when she was in her 60s, uh, her five kids had immigrated here to the Boston area and they wanted her to come. And her one condition for coming, to, for leaving her, you know, everything she knew, everyone she knew in um, tiny Taiwan, was she said, I want my uh, kids to all be nearby. And so I was really lucky that I grew up with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins and just a lot of family members just down the street and around the corner uh, from each other. Um, and then my grandmother said, well, I don't know how to open a restaurant, but I'm going to open a restaurant. <laughs> and you all are going to help me. And then her kid said, okay. <laughs> um, and so she opened uh, this restaurant, Tokyo, a Japanese restaurant, um, very traditional um, Japanese restaurant. Uh, she had grown up in Taiwan with a Japanese education um, during the time of the Japanese occupation in Taiwan. Um, and so I grew up with a lot of traditional Taiwanese as well as Japanese foods. Um, I love eating sushi and sashimi and tempura and katsu and katsudong and oyakodong and all those delicious things as well as the things that not a lot of people know about like jawan mushi or doba mushi um, so I get really excited about food um, my parents wanted me to you know do something more practical um, you know they wanted me to go to Harvard and have a solid education and um, you know pursue medicine uh, and my senior year I went to BC uh, my senior year at BC I actually started working in a restaurant called Oya, oh yeah, and uh, this is that restaurant, it is a modern Japanese restaurant here in Boston. Um, in 2008, uh, New York Times gave it the best new restaurant in the country. Um, and we uh, made some really, you know, like high-end, fine dining, um, really interesting, uh, sometimes molecular, right, um, kind of foods. And this is one of them. It's a fried Kumamoto oyster uh, with squid ink bubbles and a yuzu kosho alioli underneath. And I was just so fascinated by flavor, by blow torches, um, by taking something so familiar like sushi and sashimi that I had grown up eating and modernizing it, right? And making these like foams, right? Um, and I knew very little about the science of this, but it was fascinating and I never really asked myself again, um, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up or what do I want to do? And I just, you know, I had friends that really, um, you know, push me to just pursue my passion in cooking. And somehow I convinced my parents that this was what they should let me do. Um, 
And so from Oya, oh yeah, I went on to Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, and I studied patisserie uh, intensively because I thought, you know, the Oya oh yeah kitchen is very friendly. Um, people might leave you like a sticky note of like, hey, don't do that next time. Um, and I was like, you know, like if I'm going to be a real chef one day, like I need to be yelled at uh, in French. <laughs> and I need someone to like rush me to get things, you know, perfect. Um, and so I went to Paris to study patisserie. Uh, and, and I got all of that. It was very intensive. I, I, I uh, went to this intensive program. We did nine hours a day, um, six days a week, and you know I had like French chefs like breathing down my neck in French, being like "dépêchez-vous, dépêchez-vous, allez-vous, Tracy," and like "all right, all right, all right." This is like exactly what I wanted, um, and I made you know like one croquembouche ever. Uh, never had to make it again, but you know I got a little caramel burn, um, so I have my. I guess like war badge, um, and you know definitely don't make it as often as Joanne Chang, uh, unrelated by the way. Um, but uh, but yeah, I have made a croque <laughs> Um And from Paris, I went on to San Sebastian, Spain, because I thought, well, okay, now I have this you know very like military training, and it's school like. But what about practical, right? Like, how do I apply this to a restaurant? So then. I sought out Martin Bresategui uh, in San Sebastian, Spain. I had eaten at his restaurant in Shanghai, and I thought, wow, this food is incredible. Like, it's amazing seafood, it's um, tradition married with, um, you know, modern. And we made these, uh, we had like over 60 cooks in the kitchen, but everyone was a stage. A stage is an unpaid, you know, intern. Um, and, you know, I became one of the 60 from, and these are like kids from all over the world. Um, and we were making this beautiful, you know, food once again. And um, this is like a deconstructed uh, salad of lobster consomme gelée. And, uh, you know, just so many hands and so many people and so much process went into thinking and creating and executing the food um, for maybe 50 guests a day, or maybe if we were doing a wedding, wedding maybe for 300. Um, and I was super drawn to Martine because, again, I think I'm just a mas what, a masochist. Is that how they say it? Right, a masochist that likes pain. Right. So, so this very exigent uh, chef yelling at me in Spanish, um, and uh, you know, to really just achieve right like the highest level of excellence when it comes to cuisine and like three-star Michelin level cooking, right? And this is guy this this guy is like the chef of the chefs, right? He's not only got three-star restaurant, but he's got the most Michelin stars of any Spanish chef. So I'm like, all right, I gotta go work for this guy. And I and I can't just be anyone in the kitchen. Like I gotta make myself important to him, right? Like I gotta he he doesn't really learn people's names, right? There's like over 60 cooks in the kitchen. And there are folks cycling through the kitchen every year. They come from all over the world. You know, he doesn't have time to learn their names. He has a few folks that are full time, that are paid, that have been with him for 20 plus years. These are his like jefes de cocina, right? Like the chiefs of the kitchen. Um, and I was like, all right, how do I make myself useful to this guy? He's been around 20 plus years, you know, like I, I gotta do something. Uh, and so at that time, Instagram and Twitter were a thing, just becoming a thing. Um, that's how old I am, um, was just becoming a thing. And so, you know, I became this, like, you know, he always said, mano derecha. So I got to travel with him. I, like, showed him how to use, like, Instagram and Twitter. I did some PR stuff for him. I did some photography and videography. So I really showed him that, you know, I'm not just a cook, but I have, you know, these other, like, tools in my belt. Um, and so I got really close to Martin, and I thought I would work with him for much longer. I thought it would work for him for years. I thought he might send me to all these other restaurants because he would send people to Noma, to Dom, to, um, you know, to El Cierre de Can Roca and just, you know, kind of all over the world. These restaurants are in Spain and Copenhagen and Brazil. And that's usually how, you know, kind of chefs like build up their resumes and their experiences before they eventually open their own place. And so I thought I was going to do that. Um, but then I got this phone call and I had a family emergency and I had to come home. And my dad had all of a sudden um, had a diagnosed with gallbladder cancer. And thankfully it was very early stage, um, but at that time I had no idea, so I rushed home and I uh, you know, started taking care of him. 
and I was cooking with him. And so I uh, cooking for him, and he was recovering from this uh, surgery. He had his gallbladder completely removed. He had half of his liver removed. Um, and thankfully, uh, you know, no chemo, no radiation therapy. He was cured after um, the surgeries and recovered within like two months. But I came home at that time, and I didn't know when I would, you know, travel again. I didn't know when I would leave again because I was, you know, very worried about my dad and perhaps he would have some kind of, um, you know, situation later on. And so I decided to kind of resettle, but I had left everything in Spain. I had just built up this incredible, you know, like network of friends and really like my family, right, that I left back in Spain. Um, and I didn't really know what to do. Um, but at that time, I was really lucky that Harvard Science and Cooking was just starting. And I had some friends here who said, hey, come join us, come be a teaching fellow. And so I started doing that, and I just like reconnected, um, not only with like the amazing Science and Cooking community, but at that time, we were bringing chefs in from Spain, um, and then later from kind of all over the world, but it was heavily a Spanish crew of chefs coming. And so I thought, wow, like my, like my Spanish people, like my, my tribe is like here again. And so reconnecting with these chefs back at Science and Cooking, like uh, John and Jordi Roca here eating soft serve with Salvador, um, with Bill Yosses, uh, with Enrique and uh, Ingrid, um, I felt like I found you know, my place here in Cambridge and that's when, you know, kind of these creative juices got rolling again, right? Like I was so kind of tickled and curious by all these students and the energy and the chefs that came in. Um, and I thought, okay, like I can lay roots here, right? Like maybe this is the time. Um, and so at that time I reconnected with some old, uh, old pals at Oya oh yeah, and we started, um, you know, also just uh, cooking. Um, we just started cooking this pop-up, right? And I don't know if you've heard of a pop-up restaurant, but this was also becoming a thing at the time. So again, Instagram, Twitter, just starting. And we started this pop-up called Gucci's Midnight Ramen. And the idea for it was just, hey, I'm hungry. It's midnight. Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Okay, we just got off work, right? Like, I mean, I didn't get off work, but I was at home, you know, cooking for my dad. They had just gotten off work at, oh yeah, and they're like, I'm hungry. And Momofuku was like kind of a big deal at the time in New York, and like ramen was just like blowing up. But there wasn't really places here to get ramen. And so we just started experimenting in our kitchens. And that led to, oh, like our friend Jason Bond at Bondir was like, hey, come cook ramen at my kitchen. We'll invite some other like chef and bartender friends. Okay, so we like threw these parties, right, at midnight in our friend's restaurant after they closed. I don't know how we all had energy for this, but somehow we did. Um, and then that turned into like midday ramen, that turned into my friend Boaz here, like hosting us at his startup. Um, and we just brought in like all these folks from the arts, from tech, from, you know, Harvard, MIT, from uh, nonprofit. And it was really just over a bowl of noodles, right? And over some fluffy pork belly bao. But everyone just wanted to bond over good food, right? And even better company. Um, and that's where, you know, all of these creative ideas, right, these juices were just flowing. And I really started to, you know, gather the puzzle pieces of, like, what I envisioned my restaurant to be, to not just be a restaurant, right, but to be a gathering place for these food um, and food people and these conversations. Um, and... You know, I had the help of my friend uh, Aaron, who is a designer and an entrepreneur, and we um, kind of set out on this journey. I had to go to Spain to visit some friends, and so we're here jumping at El Cerro de Candroca, and we jumped all around Spain, and I had to interview these architects, and I had to like think about the design of my space and of my menu and just all these things when you want to open a restaurant, right? It's not just like... I've never done this before. <laughs> um, and it's not like there's just this guidebook of how to do it. Um, so I was going around collecting all these puzzle pieces and Aaron's like, you know what? Sometimes you just have to take that leap, take that chance and just jump, go for it, right? And so that's why we're here kind of jumping around the world. This is one of my chefs back at Martine. Um, and I was fortunate that this guy in the middle, John Bush, he's a professor of applied mathematics at MIT. 
I met him after a Jose Andres lecture at uh, Science and Cooking. And John and I just bonded over food. I like overheard him saying San Sebastian, Paris, Croissant. And I'm like, who is this guy? Didn't even ask his name. We just like started talking about food. Um, and that turned into just like this incredible friendship, but also like tapas party after tapas party. And it's like not just, oh, let me like R&D my menu, but it's like, hey, let me like meet people from the community of where I may open my restaurant one day and like see what they think about not just the food and not just the drink, but about like what they want out of, you know, a restaurant experience and what they want out of a community. And so I didn't actually um, get a good uh, photo from the night that we hosted this party for the landlords, right? So I was this like 20 something, you know, female minority, like chef, like trying to open a restaurant in Cambridge and um, pitching to landlords. And I had already failed several times pitching to other landlords. And I was like, how is this time gonna be any different, right? And I thought, okay, well, like typically what chefs do when they open a restaurant and they pitch to landlords is that while they have already several restaurants, they have like a James Beard Award under their belt. Like I don't have that stuff. And I don't definitely don't have like decades of experience. Like I'm not in my 40s, 50s, right? I'm not a guy, I'm not a restaurant group. But what I did have were these friends in the community. So I kind of tricked the landlords. I told them, hey, come to this dinner. Here's the address and didn't say much else. And the address happened to be at an MIT dorm that was uh, John's best friend, John, um, who was also an MIT professor. And he uh, and his wife, Anne, were so gracious to host us, and they were headmasters at this dorm. And I thought, all right, this is like big space. It's down the street from Pagu. So OK, it has you know, meaning in terms of place. It has meaning in terms of people, because these people have been you know, my tribe for the past you know, like four plus years. And so I invited 15 plus other folks from the community. Again, they're in like arts, nonprofit, tech. Um, and I was like, all right, these guys will help me con convince the landlords. And, um, and somehow it worked, right? And uh, so they gave me the space. Um, and my friends came to help me like lay the foundation. And this is actually the team from Mugaritz. And we are in the dark at my restaurant under construction. Um, and of course, Aaron took this photo because he's very creative, very artistic. And again, this is like the time where like I'm trying to gather all these puzzle pieces, trying to build the restaurant, like so much pressure, but also just like exponential learning and creativity at this point. And these guys come and they come to like cook at Harvard and, um, and lecture. And I'm like, hey, do you want to come see my empty restaurant space? <laughs> and, you know, they come and, you know, pretend to help me build this and literally like lay the foundation and pour the concrete. Um, and today, you know, the restaurant looks a little bit different. We've definitely evolved since then. We're actually, you know, like built. We have furniture. Uh, it's been four plus years, and we have certainly evolved the space, the menu, the design, the people, um, the pugs. Um, and uh, it's nice because it all kind of comes full circle back to science and cooking because now I have a hub, I have a restaurant, I have a place that I can invite the professors and the students. And when there's the final project, like I invite students to come to my restaurant, they get to eat anything they want on the menu, and we get to talk about like some of the things we're working on. And so I thought like, hey, my menu is really cool. Like I developed this dish like one time with my friends at my birthday party. I wanted to create like a really delicious savory waffle. And I thought, oh, I'll call it the wafflato because it's waffle and potato. Because what did I want out of this waffle was I wanted something savory, something crispy, something delicious and cheesy. But I wanted it to taste like bacon, but not really be bacon. So I got this like smoked mozzarella and caramelized shallots. And I was like, wow, this is really delicious. And then I was like, you know what? I think these kids can make it even better, right? And so I was like, hey, like, we've actually been listening to a lot of these Cambridge guests coming in. And a lot of folks are uh, celiac and gluten free. And this is, you know, something we should be more mindful and we should like redevelop our menu and rework it to really suit our community. And so these students took that challenge and William and Lore, you know, did like such a simple modification. Um, you know, it was a one-for-one -one substitution of AP flour to rice flour. 
um, and then a reduction of olive oil by 50% in the final recipe. So it seems very simple, right? But they went through this like elaborate process of actually testing various flours. So rice flour, uh, buckwheat flour, tapioca, um, and uh, you know, and really reworking this recipe and applying the science and math to it to demonstrate that this was ultimately and technically a scientifically more uh, crispy uh, waffle that stayed crispier for longer. Um, and so the menu evolves with the help of these students. And during COVID, we have also evolved the menu. Um, we're not really, you know, like, oh, yeah, we're not this super, super high-end fine, uh, fine dining restaurant. But we do have people who come to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays and whatnot. And during COVID, it's been really difficult, right? Because, um, you know, we've had to do a lot of takeout. We were shut down for, for much of it. Um, and so, you know, I started getting creative in the kitchen. Everyone else was making sourdough, and I'm making this, like, pan de cristal because I love pan de cristal. And then I find out that in Spain, everyone just buys their pan de cristal. Jose Andres, for his restaurant, he buys his pan de cristal. Why? Because it's hard to make pan de cristal, and you need space to make it. And I don't think anyone has really spent the time to kind of like figure out the science of how to make pan de cristal. Anyway, so I worked on that. Um, we also made some squid ink uh, calamari pizza, which I loved. Um, and we made handful noodles. And that's what, you know, everyone's kind of here to talk about today, right? Um, and so I've always wanted to put handful noodles on the menu, right? Like, like I said, we did these ramen pop-ups. We're famous for our ramen. We're famous for our bao. Like, people love us for those things. And I always thought, like, those things are always going to be, like, the top sellers, right? Like, how will anything ever beat that? And somehow, handful noodles during the pandemic have become, like, this top seller. And I'm like, oh, great. Cool. Um, and I want to talk a bit about its history. So I did not invent hand-pulled noodles. I'm also not a hand-pulled noodle expert, by the way. I'm kind of just a hand-pulled noodle hack. Like, I figured out how to do it, that it works really well in my restaurant. Um, but I do want to show you that there is, um, like, a history to hand-pulled noodles. Um, and supposedly, it is from Lanzo in China. And I have never been to Lanzo, but I have had Lanzo-style hand-pulled noodles. Um, I studied abroad in Beijing, and I've had them there, and I've had them around in other places uh, in China. But I thought it would be helpful for us to watch this quick video um, of how it is made in Lanzo. In this way, you guys also know that like I'm a complete hack because really this is not our process. Here, guys. The noodle mountain. We've got a team of three here stretching out this dough and pulling it and getting it ready for the lineup of hundreds of customers out the door. And there it is. It's a total bundle of dough. All right, check it out, guys. It's Trevor James. Just got off the train. We're in Lanzhou, China. We made it to the home of hand-pulled noodles in China. This is our world noodle tour, and today we're bringing you for a full-on Chinese noodle adventure. Let's check it out. This is it. Okay, so that is some serious uh, hand-pulled noodle. We do not make that much <laughs> dough at Pagu at a time. Um, but I'll show you uh, what we do uh, at Pagu. Um, and those masters of noodle, like, they spend years perfecting that craft. Um, when they go to take their final exam, they have to show, you know, demonstrate that they can do nine different kinds of hand-pulled noodles, and those are different thicknesses and doubling and doubling of the dough. Not as easy as it looks, but if anyone wants to attempt that for their final project, that would be really cool. Um, what I am familiar with in terms of uh, another restaurant that does a type of hand-pulled noodle is there's this place called Heidi Lao, and it is a um, <laughs> chain.
So Heidi Lau is this, um, you know, this like uh, this, this chain, this uh, restaurant. They do hot pot, um, and they have this this chef that goes around and does this kind of like almost ribbon dancing with the noodle, right? And so there's all different kinds of hand pulled noodles, right? There's like the slenzo kind. There's this ribbon dancing kind, um, and you know, and we have our kind at Pagu as well. Um, the Lenzo's uh, kind of recipe of hand pulled noodles, I'll go further into later. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is what we know, right? This is the Pagu recipe. If anyone wants to you know, take a photo, copy it down, you're welcome to. I'm happy to send it to you as well. Um, but so what happened during the pandemic was like I looked online and I was like, all right, let me look at a bunch of different recipe for hand-pulled noodles. I've always had this idea of doing it. I've tried making it like over 10 years ago. Back then there was way less internet literature about it. Um, now, if you look, like Serious Eats has a recipe. They like dig into the science. Um, I have like a link to that here as well. Um, but what I did was I looked at a bunch of recipes. I said, how do we simplify this? Because anything that we do at my restaurant, it has to be scalable. So what does that mean? Okay, yes, we have to be able to make it for like 200 people, 300 people a day, right? But on top of that, it needs to be consistent consistently good, right, like excellent, and like everyone in my kitchen needs to be able to make this and make it consistently, right? And so the recipe has to be simple and it has to be kind of like dummy proof, right? Or if we go wrong with it, we need to understand why. And that's why having a scientific background is really important. Um, and so I looked at a bunch of recipes and I was like, all right, these are the ratios, these are the flours that people are using. And then I just started experimenting in my own kitchen and then this is what I found that works for us at Pagu. And it's AP flour, um, it's not bread flour, some other recipes call for bread flour. Uh, we use hot water, some other recipes don't use hot water, but we do. Um, and this is just hot water right after boiling. Uh, we use sea salt uh, versus kosher salt or other salts, and we use canola oil. And we use canola oil in the dough itself as well as afterwards um, to kind of uh, put on top to lubricate. Um, and we have a trick. Um, and our trick is to vacuum seal the dough. Right? So I had originally read about vacuum sealing the dough. Um, on Aki and Alex's uh, food blog called Ideas in Food. They also have this really wonderful book. Um, and so you can go, you know, Google them, check it out. Um, but they had mentioned like vacuum sealing dough to speed up the process of like resting the dough, right? So you know when you make like pasta dough or you make cookie dough and it says like refrigerate overnight or cover with plastic and rest it for an hour and then work it, right? So when you vacuum seal it, you're speeding up that process. And Dave and I were talking about this too, and I'm really curious about like the other science that's going on when you vacuum seal it. Because what a vacuum sealer does, it takes out all the air bubbles and it hydrates the dough. Um, and and you know this has like a wonderful kind of surface area right to it. Um, and I'm curious, like, okay, well, there have certainly been moments at the restaurant where we're like. Oh my God, we're sold out of noodles. We didn't put a count in. We got to make noodles on the fly, right? That means like immediately we need noodles now ASAP. And so what we've done is we've like gone back there. We've mixed it. And, um, you know, the hot water is important, but that mixing time in the stand mixer on high for 15 minutes is also crucial. What I had here was Julia and Alex made um, some dough at uh, 11 a.m. and at 12 p.m. And this dough has not been vacuum sealed. And you can see that if I try and stretch this dough, thank you. Uh, if I try and stretch this dough, you know, it's kind of stretchy, but like it's very thick and it just breaks, right? But meanwhile, if I take the vacuum sealed dough, and this is from my restaurant, so it was made the other day. Um, a few days ago, and it's got some nice canola oil coated in here. And what we do during service, right on the noodle station, is that we open up these packets, and my cook is much faster at opening it. We flip it out. And the key to this dough, too, is like not reworking it. 
So sometimes you might be like, oh, I got this dough. I'm going to like take it out of under the plastic and like, you know, give it a few needs before I like do anything with it. No, you want it to be well rested um, and flat, even, kind of as is. We cut it into these, you know, kind of like thick chewing gum pieces, flatten it, and it stretches right out. And it's called biang biang noodles, right? Because of this kind of like slapping sound, right? Like, right? That's like the biang biang part of it. Is it necessary? Eh, you know, I mean, I can do it without the sound. I can do it very gently, and I can even do it like on the surface gently to not break it because you'll see that it can kind of, uh, kind of break. And the trick is to get it as, you know, kind of thin as possible. So even if I take a noodle and I start to kind of separate this, if you guys have ever made like streusel or if you've ever baked and you're looking for like that window, right? Like they talk about pulling and stretching the dough to look for that window to see if the gluten is developed enough. If you guys come up close later, you can see, and here it starts to break, right? But you can kind of see like, okay, how thin can I really pull this dough before it starts to, uh, starts to tear and have these, have these holes. Um, but anyway, so this is the dough that we use and the vacuum sealing technique works for us. Um, but I'm super curious, like what, what is the science behind that, right? Um, and this is about as scientific as my lecture gets. <laughs> Again, I am not a scientist, um, but I pulled this off of the internet like any other uh, chef might. Um, and, you know, I have like heard several lectures here where we've talked about gliadin and gluten and the components of gluten. And so I'm kind of wondering, right, like there are these like globular, uh, you know, gliadins and these like long strands of gluten in, right? And there's this mesh structure that happens like when you're developing the gluten, when you say you're working the dough, right? And like I said earlier, like we, for our recipe, if we mix it for five minutes, for 10 minutes, it doesn't really work. Right? Um, if we mix it for 15 minutes and then we vacuum seal it, it works. But like, what is that threshold? Right? Like, what if I mix it for 20? What if I mix it for 25? Also, the threshold is like, how much can my stand mixer <laughs> go, right? Like, go at it without just like falling off or like breaking, right? That's like another question of just like, how long will the motor last? Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting to kind of explore this because I don't think we are yet, you know, masters of our craft. And even though I figured out this hack for my restaurant, and like there's always, you know, ways to improve upon the recipes that we have. Um, and so, like, what is happening when we vacuum seal the dough, right? I talked about, like, removing the, um, you know, uh, removing the air, resting the dough. Okay, now it's hydrated, right? But like, what happens to the gliadin and to the glutenin, right? I don't know. Um, and I wanted to go back, um, you know, kind of to that Lanzo uh, noodle recipe and also to the Serious Eats article that I had mentioned, um, but just kind of like further food for thought. Um, you know, other recipes I found, uh, they contain, um, uh, you know, like the, the fineness of the flour, right? Like I read these articles about like Lanzo noodles and how it needs to be freshly milled flour or as fresh as possible. Um, and then it's uh, finely milled, all right? So if finely milled, like what is, what is the coarseness of that flour, right? But also if it's finely milled, then the absorption of water, it's going to absorb more water. Right? And so, um, what else? Like, what if we wanted to introduce like whole wheat and buckwheat into the equation? I don't know that we can do like 100% whole wheat, right? Um, or 100% buckwheat. That's like soba noodles, right? We know that soba noodles are not going to be a hand pulled noodle. Or I don't know, maybe they could be if you, you added other things that make it stretchy. But the buckwheat itself is not going to um, have gluten because it's gluten free. Um, and, you know, like oil, right? Like, what if we were using sesame oil? What if we were using olive oil? What if we were infusing the oil with herbs to give it more flavor, right? You see these, like, spinach noodle doughs. Well, the spinach can be incorporated in various ways. You could, in you could also make, you know, like, basil-infused oil and, and include that in your recipe. 
Um, and then these uh, Lanzo noodles, they use alkali. And so there's something called penghui, which is um, the ash from uh, mugwort. Um, and, uh, you know, I have its you know, uh, components here. Um, kansui I'm more familiar with. I've actually never used uh, penghui, but kansui is lye water. And that is used in ramen noodle making. And I have used that before. And I've used a little bit, you know, a very, like, less than... 5%, right, like in my ramen noodle recipe, um, because it's so difficult to work with. It makes the noodle dough um, yellow in color. It makes it really tough, but that's what gives it the QQ, in Taiwanese we say QQ, um, in Italian they say al dente, right, but you have to have this kind of like nice, bouncy, springy bite to the noodle, right? Um, and so, right, like, are we going to vacuum seal it? Or are we going to need it, and if we do, for how long? But, um, you know, back to my pan de cristal recipe, that is a no-need recipe. And so if you look at, like, the science of, like, no-need recipes, can that be applied to noodle making? I don't know. But, um, you know, just food for thought for you guys. Meanwhile, like, the kind of different iterations that we have done are quite simple. Um, we have made a squid ink version. Um, and that's just by incorporating, you know, in that recipe that I had maybe like 10, 20 grams of squid ink into that recipe. Um, doesn't, you know, affect the texture um, so, so much, but, you know, it's beautiful. It's delicious. It's got a little bit of that kind of um, sea, uh, seafood taste to it. And so, um, you know, in addition to evolving our food menu, um, you know, for takeout, for pizza, for all these things, for noodles. Um, we've also really evolved, um, you know, the, the work that we do at the restaurant. And this was a photo that I took with Jose Andres uh, just after opening my restaurant. He came to visit with Nate Mook. And if you guys know Jose Andres, he started a really cool thing called World Central Kitchen. And he had come in, you know, like four years ago after he had... Um, you know, recently started the organization, and he had just come back from his first trip to Haiti. And he gave this incredible presentation uh, at Harvard about it. And I was like, I'm so inspired, right? I'm like, Jose is the chef of the chefs, but on top of that, he is like the humans for the humans, right? The people for the people, right? And so Jose had talked about you know, using his platform and helping all these folks in need and delivering them food in emergency situations. And during COVID, you know, this was a reminder to me that we as chefs, as members of the community, we can all do more um, to be better uh, in our communities. And I thought, okay, one thing is to feel inspired, but another thing is to take action. And Jose came actually last winter um, this was taken December 2019, right after the Science and Cooking Lectures, because we were celebrating the 10-year anniversary. He's here with Harold McGee. There's air from Clover. You guys might go to Clover pretty often here. Um, I'm there. I'm, like, super pregnant. Um, and John McGee's there and some other friends. And, you know, I was reminded, like, right before the pandemic hit, the pandemic hit just months later, right, in March, and I had, like, no foresight, you know, then at this, like, party, right? Like, look, we're all unmasked. <laughs> um, there's probably COVID, you know, in Cambridge at the time, and we're, like, here hanging out. And, um, and you know, if I had enough foresight to kind of see what was about to happen and kind of realize that our lives would be forever changed, you know? Um, but, you know, seeing Jose then, and then three months later, calling them up, calling up, you know, Jose and Nate Mook at World Central Kitchen and being like, hey, like, we want to get involved, right? So what we did was, in March, uh, I think it was March 16th, the, gover the governor said, hey, restaurants, you got to shut down, you can do a takeout, but nope, no people can go in and out to dine anymore, and we're like, okay, what do we do, right? And so we started two nonprofit initiatives first of which was called Off Their Plate um, to feed frontline healthcare workers and employ restaurants and their employees uh, to make these hot meals going to these COVID uh, units in healthcare centers. And we expanded that to was it, 11 cities uh, nationwide, uh, raised over $8 million, um, and it was with the help of this community, right? Like, I had a restaurant regular write me this idea, and she was an 
HBS, HMS um, student at the time. And we just got everyone we knew together in a virtual Zoom meeting room to start this. And it was incredible. I think like Barack Obama retweeted this photo of, um, of my employees. And we really just wanted to create a way for these restaurants to safely prepare food for people in need. Um, and I guess like the, you know, there was like a semi like naive component to it. You know, we were like, yeah, we're going to do all this good. And we were doing good. And then we got this message from this wonderful person who had received our food uh, in the ER. And she's like, thank you so much. Like after a long day and us, you know, battling COVID on the front lines, this hot meal like meant so much to us. But please, like I have a family at home. I have a salary. I have a job. Please redirect your efforts to people in need. And so that really got me thinking about like, what does that mean, right? Like, who are the people in need? And the people in need were my employees. We were driving, you know, carpooling to work because we didn't know, right, like how safe was it out there? And we wanted to be as safe as possible. And so we started this organization um, called Project Restore Us. In the wake of the pandemic, it became vital to provide culturally appropriate food to those who were food insecure. Community organizers are doing amazing work, but they don't always have the right resources to scale up or to find the right suppliers. That's where we come in. We are Project Restore Us, and we partner community organizations providing food to families with the wholesale supply chain. Project Restore Us lets community organizers do what they do best, connecting with their community and providing food to improve their health and prevent food insecurity. Project Restore Us. Come partner with us. And so, you know, we realized that the need was even greater just around the corner um, from our restaurant. And this is actually taken in the parking lot of May's restaurant, which is my friend's restaurant just down the street. It's on the intersection of Main Street and Windsor. And you think, okay, Cambridge is MIT, Cambridge is Harvard, Cambridge is Moderna and Pfizer, right? We are all these things. And we have so many incredible people who wanted to like help us start and like rally and feed people. But Cambridge is also one in eight food insecure, right? And Chelsea, where uh, Chelsea, Revere, Dorchester, Mattapan, like I was making these deliveries and they are one in four food insecure. And food insecurity was a problem even before COVID. And so we just transformed our restaurants to become these hubs of you know, packing groceries that were culturally appropriate to feed these families in need. These are families who got COVID. These are families who worked in hospitality, um, who had like nail salon businesses. Um, you know, we connected with them because we talked to existing community organizations who had relationships and had trust built over decades with these people. And they knew what their people needed. And they didn't need to go get in the line at a food bank that was offering, you know, like mountains of like corned beef hash and like Mountain Dew and, you know, stuff that they've never eaten, right? Um, and, and like get COVID from being in line, right? Um, and these are, you know, like elders who couldn't leave their home. These are folks who are immunocompromised. And so we organized this wonderful door-to-door -door delivery system. We had incredible volunteers like you guys from the community who came out through, you know, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and, you know, these channels um, to reach us to figure out how we could all, you know, just volunteer and how we could just make our community a better place. Um, so as much as this is about hand pulled noodles and science and cooking, um, it really is about this food and community and collaboration and really understanding that our place here as chefs, as restaurant owners, um, as you know, curious students um, looking to have a place in the community, um, you know, like we are all here for each other. And so if we lift each other up, you know, we will all be better because of that. So thank you so much. <laughs>